Yes. yes. Good evening. Okay. Good. So then let's get started. All right. So the topic for today's lecture is agent-based modeling and simulation. Um, so first of all, um, I want to emphasize the difference uh, between the approach that we have been studying so far, sort of the prediction machine learning and um, simulations. The main idea is that when we deal with any kind of predictive analytics, we do start with the data. And then we use various algorithms to find patterns in the data and uh, based on those patterns, make certain predictions, right? And, um, you know, sometimes the data has time dependency, so then the prediction will go into the future. Uh, we, we can predict into the future. Um, sometimes data um, doesn't have time dependency, then we can predict missing points or, or something else. And we can also uh, detect patterns, find clusters, et cetera, et cetera. What simulation? Well, simulation is slightly different process. When we try to do simulations, we actually first build a model that is based on our understanding of the domain, um, our understanding of the processes. So we try to build some simplified version of reality. Um, and um, you know, we do it sort of the way we think um, it should work. And then we actually run those simulations, right? Um, if, you, if we think about, well, maybe if we talk about, say, um, you know, if you're familiar with, with uh, a neural network um, approach where you have like generative models, right? Those that generate distributions. Well, here um, it's also in some sense a generative model because it generates uh, based on a scenario, it generates some results. Now, um, of course, the way we, when we build a model, we first want to validate it, validate it on the historical data, make sure the model, the predictions from the model or the description from the model matches the data. And then we can play different scenarios, ask what if questions. Now, um, probably one of the, uh, you know, easiest application, well, not easiest, but uh, easier to understand application is say a simulation for say, you know, transportation network where, um, you know, we uh, put together the simulation, um, you know, we run it, we get some results, we compare them um, with what we have observed previously in the network, um, or let's say distribution network. Let's say we want to simulate how goods being distributed through the supply chain to different um, stores and, um, you know, we, we run a simulation, we, we compare to the sort of baseline scenarios to what's actually um, happening in real life. We make sure our simulation reproduces more or less this real life situation. And then we can change the parameters, uh, for example, you know, increase volumes or, or do other things and then uh, play what if scenarios. So again, um, the difference between uh, traditional sort of predictive analytics and a simulation, all right? Now, what we're gonna talk about today is a very specific type of simulation, which is called agent-based modeling. And um, it is actually a very, very, very powerful method. Um, and it is a, it's, it's a computational approach um, that allows you to model a system that consists of individual autonomous, interacting entities, and we call them agents, and we can simulate um, their behavior. And an agent, it's, it's a discrete entity. It can be, an, you know, we can think about it as modeling a person or an object or, um, or a company um, with particular properties, action, own goals, and particular behavior. Now, it's of course the easiest way to think about this is if we want to simulate social system. Let's say we have people, we have customers, um, or we have uh, um, you know buyers and sellers. We have a market, um, and then agent-based model will uh, where every customer um, 
will be presented as an agent and has certain properties and there'll be certain type of interactions that happen um, between them. Or you can think about, again, um, you know, social network in some sense can be an agent-based model of our real interaction. Um, wh where do people use those, that type of modeling? It's actually very, very widely used. Um, if you think about marketing, um, you want you can try to simulate you know promotion response. You can try Yay! to simulate brand loyalty and how people will switch products. Overall consumer behavior, competitors. So again, agents can be firms um, or consumers and other things. If you think about business units, well, you can think about you know identifying bottlenecks in the process in the business and then agents will be different units of the business um, of course financial simulations where we have a financial market and you try to estimate investment risks and uh, you know every agent can be again um, a, a person or an entity that plays on the market um, and has certain type of behavior. And then you get a lot of people interacting there, buying and selling. Um, transportation, where we talk about traffic planning, um, you know, the, the, the throughput for the stations, you want to calculate or estimate um, how many people go by certain location. Um, you know, the simplest things with unfortunately not happening in Moscow, like correct traffic light timing, um, and simulating it, you know, how, what delays it causes. Um, and of course, overall sort of transportation infrastructure, modeling um, how traffic flows through that, uh, through the streets. Um, and, and, and in terms of operations, um, of course, it's, you know, the optimal design for the supply chain. It is, can be a warehouse set up. Um, resource allocation, how optimally allocate resources to different tasks, uh, production planning, et cetera, et cetera. Notice, by the way, that if we talk about operations, um, you know, this sounds a lot like optimization problem and linear programming problem, which is very true. A lot of those things can be solved by linear programming and optimization. Um, the challenge is, it is, well, sometimes the problems are actually very, very large and it's a hard, hard to solve, uh, but, also, there is a very simple thing um, that, that, that usually happens in business. If you make a complicated um, system of equations, you solve it, you provide the solution. You know, it's, it's actually hard to believe um, that what you've done is correct. It's hard to convince people that what you have done is correct. Simulation has this amazing power uh, of convincing people after they watch simulation and getting the results, um, they, they, then it, they, they're easier to go and implement them. In fact, quite often, um, software that is available for supply chain design, they actually have two modes. One mode is actually optimization through the solution of, of through the solution of um, um, linear optimization problem to uh, um, very much sort of simulation of, of um, the, the operations of the supply chain. And of course, uh, there are things that uh, you know, we're not talking about here, but there is a lot of usage in, in, in science, in healthcare, um, say uh, the spread of, you know, COVID, um, the, the, the sort of the best model are done not through differential equations, but through simulations. So anytime where we have time dependency, simulations is a very, very powerful tool. And actually, um, again, for COVID-based models, it's agent-based simulation, uh, propagating, uh, disease propagating through the contacts on a social network. Um, there exists very powerful uh, you know, software packages um, that allows you to do simulation and say this AnyLogic is an example of, of, of such a software um, used a lot in operations, um, but it has Russian roots, um, the founders. Um, and um, uh, they even provide you know, nice cartoonish visualization um, to their to their models, and you see here examples of, of um, op optimization for, um, uh, for for traffic, for, for train station, uh, for factory, uh, pass and and uh, for passenger flow, etc., um, etc. Et so, 
why and when uh, you should use this agent-based modeling? Well, the, the real systems, real world systems, they're becoming more and more complex and interdependent. And it is very challenging um, to actually find and, and, and put together equations um, that would describe the evolution of the system with time. And instead of actually going through this um, you know, equation writing um, and trying to reproduce what happens with a complex system, um, one can think about slightly different approach, um, going sort of uh, not top down, but the bottom up, thinking about each component of the system, um, setting up rules for those uh, components and making them interact and then observe um, the, the system behavior. In fact, uh, in very many complex systems, there's just no way to um, you know, write an equation um, that will describe this, this behavior. Um, but simulation allows us to do this. Um, other point is when we get, you know, when we have systems where uh, decision-making is decentralized, right? And, uh, you know, again, if you think about modeling stock market, well, um, the decisions are done um, by every single uh, participant of the market independently. Okay, they might be influenced by influencers, but it is, there is no sort of central um, uh, unit that, that dictates buying or selling things. And that's for you know, any market. Think about you know, stock market, think about you know, apartment rental or whatever you want, right? Um, if the, the systems are large and things changing with time, that's also very challenging to model uh, from the first principles um, or um, um, sort of writing equations. And finally, um, you know, we would like to have what if scenarios, um, sort of playing different scenarios and trying to see what happens if you change certain type of parameters. Um, and you know, eventually, if you want some sort of visualization, right? How how system evolve? Again, this can be a, um, a, a good um, a, a good approach. Now, I'll show you an example where it will be very clear that um, it pretty pretty much impossible to use um, simple or actually or complicated prediction models um, trying to. Kind of predict the future based on the history um, because the system evolves and changes um, and uh, in, in, a, in a quite stochastic way. Um, so if we want to do this agent-based simulation, um, then uh, what do we need to do? Well, um, there are three things needed. So first of all, we need to define agent, like sort of what agent is and what properties it has and how it performs. Um, second, we need to describe um, the, the relationship interaction between agents. So um, again, this can be, okay, what happens when agents interact? For example, one buys, one sells, one rents, one leases, um, et cetera, et cetera. And environment, environment in which everything is happening. And um, in this sense, agent can perceive the environment, so perceive the state of environment, and then perform certain action. Which means, you know, agent internally should have some rules. And those rules can be very, very simple, like sort of if then, or it can be more complex. Um, in fact, um, you know, agent can have sort of memory of previous actions and uh, learn um, on the previous um, actions and on the responses of the system. So agent can become smarter and smarter. And this kind of connects this to reinforcement learning um, in, in, in AI. Um, but here we actually considering not only a single agent, but we're considering multiple agents. And, and the, 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 the problem that we're interested in is not that much of a learning of individual agent, though we can have smart agents, but more of uh, how group of agents interact and how their individual decision leads to um, performance overall of, of the market or, or of the system. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about market, like sort of market crashes. That's, you know, that, that's um, one of the things that had happens. So agents are, is, is a discrete entity that has certain goals and behavior built in, right? So respond, um, so it's, kind of 
pre-wired how the agent will respond on uh, changes in the environment or actions of other agents. Um, agents are not autonomous, and so every agent make, makes its own decision. And it can actually, again, can modify that behavior depending on environment. Um, agents can be homogeneous, so it can be like sort of, okay, yeah, the same type of agents on the, like, on the ants, for example, right? Or it can be diverse and heterogeneous, different type of agents performing different actions. Um, as I said before, it can have memory um, and different internal models. And, you know, it's going to be people, robots, organizations, transportation units, sort of pretty much any discrete um, entity, we can try to model it as an agent. So in order to, 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 to create this model, um, we need to define agent, we need to define the relationships and define the environment. Now, very important that there is no sort of central controller or a central authority exists that, that um, you know, tells agents what to do, and agents operate um, internally on internal decisions, but there is a single clock that synchronizes those things. So there is a single clock that ticks um, through the through this simulation, and agent on every step does something. Sometimes they do it um, taking turns, sometimes you know, they can act simultaneously. Um, What's important is that interaction among agents, it's, it's local. So it is really defined again, not by centralized system, but the agents themselves, you know, think social network connections that are allowed. And, you know, agents can, can live in three-dimensional world in our real world, or it can live in the virtual world. Um, it doesn't matter. Somehow we're gonna define um, when they start interacting. And overall, for the entire system, well, there, you can actually monitor um, certain functions for the entire system the way, again, if you think about stock market, it changes, but there is overall the, the value of the stock market, right? The amount of money made in the stock market, um, you can actually monitor it, right? Um, you can monitor the, the, the S&P or, or sort of any other indices that depend um, on um, you know buying and, and selling performance actions of um, the clients, but then there is this parameters for the entire market we can monitor, and the same thing um, can be true for sort of anything. You can you know look, look at the system and, and calculate the optimal um, parameter. For example, you know, you can calculate the total time spent in traffic jams. Uh, by cars, and you, you can try changing rules that are used by every agent to uh, minimize that time, for example. So um, I, I want to introduce this topic through a very, very, very famous model. Um, we actually, uh, pretty much in all our previous lectures, we kind of talked about um, the very, very recent development in machine learning and data science and the way it's used directly in business. Here, I want to actually go back to 1970 um, and to the model proposed by Thomas Schilling. And this is more about um, economics, but it is such a famous and a fundamental model. Um, and it's actually a very, very nice example of um, agent-based modeling. So I wanna talk about, about it. Um, and uh, Thomas Schilling, he's it's an American economist who got Nobel Prize uh, for his work in economics on micromodius and macro behavior. And um, this is one of sort of his papers back 1971. Uh, it's called Dynamic Model Segregation. And he got interested in, in the following question. He realized by looking at the city maps that cities are quite often are segregated, which means there are parts of the cities where, for example, white people live, black people live, Asian people live. So people live in these communities um, with a very, very few or pretty much no sort of strangers now. And um, he was actually looking at the racial segregation, but this can be true and uh, regarding the wealth and, and you know language and anything else. And so the question for him, the, the question he was trying to answer was that, you know, in general, you know, people are quite educated and don't seem to be racist. But at the same time, 
um, you know, it, it all results in the segregation of the cities. Now, this picture is not what Thomas Schilling saw. This is actually quite new. It's uh, US census of 2010 and um, Chicago. And if you notice, um, the, the lake is on the right hand side, if you know the geography there. Um, and um, if you notice, there is a very, very clear cut boundaries um, where the, the, the sort of differentiate the areas, the clusters where Hispanic, Asian, white, black people live, right? But at the same time, um, and the question that um, uh, Thomas Schilling was asking, um, if you interview those people, most of them are kind of okay living um, with other races um, around them. But how does it happen that though each and every agent, right, each and every person is okay, but, um, and quite tolerant, uh, it still results in this very clear cut segregation. And so he proposed this model um, to answer this question. He put together this model. Um, where he showed that though personal preferences of every person can be um, such that they're, that the tolerance is pretty high. So, you know, people can tolerate half of their neighborhood of being of different um, race, but still it leads to, on the macro scales, um, leads to segregation. So, um, this is a case where this micro preferences and micro motives means um, the preferences of each individual person can lead to significant changes in macroscopic behavior. So in order to answer and to understand how this works, he proposed um, to you this agent-based modeling, literally, uh, where every person would be an agent. And then there are some rules um, that uh, he came forward with. And on the right-hand side on the slide, you actually see, you know, back in the 70s, okay, he didn't have computers to simulate this. So he literally played this game, right? He looked at the evolution, um, the changes that would happen with the society on, uh, you know, by drawing by, by on, a, on, a, on a paper with a pencil and um, sort of simulating um, the behavior and then you know, getting, this, um, um, getting these areas, segregated areas. Now let's talk about the model. And this is right now, we'll actually define the agents, right? And, this, and we'll define the environment and we define um, uh, sort of all three things that we need for, for, for modeling. So first of all, um, let's say population consists of two types of agents, right? So we'll have two types of agents. One agent, let's say red, one black, the way it is on this picture, or red and blue. And agents reside on the cells of the grid, two-dimensional grid, and that's environment. Um, and every agent will have um, eight neighbors. Now you can, you know, it's if you're doing it yourself, you can set up, you know, whatever, four neighbors or any other geometry has. And um, uh, some cells are populated with agents and, and, and some unpopulated. So people live on some cells and they don't live on other. You know, if you think about, I don't know, Dutchess, right? That's what it, it looks like very much. So every agent wants to have no more than some fraction of neighbors unlike him. So if it's a red agent, he will want to have no more than some number of black agents living around him, all right? So if it is all of his, of the same color as him, he is satisfied. If it is all of a different color, he will not be satisfied, but he'll be still satisfied if there is some uh, fraction of his neighbors are of different type. And so then we have an environment, we have an agent, and here's the rules. On every round of this simulation, unsatisfied agent will move to a new cell 
where he'll be satisfied. And satisfied agent doesn't move, he just stays. And this continues until everyone either is satisfied or, you know, we got to this frozen state when nobody uh, can move anymore. So on the right hand side, there is an example. If there is a tolerance in the system um, for sevens, so which means um, you know the, the the red agent is is can be satisfied um, if it has up to four um, neighbors of uh, the same color as his. Then on this picture, he's satisfied because he has one, two, three, four. Um, only four uh, of, of opposite color. And then there is one empty spot. But if by whatever reason, number five uh, got replaced or if number five was initially um, a black agent, then for agent X, this is not a satisfactory scenario. And then when it is his turn, he will actually move, and in this picture, he'll probably move to the position number seven, because then he'll have uh, four neighbors of uh, um, opposite type, and and so that's sort of within his tolerance limit. And so if he is if he is satisfied, so utility his utility increases, and then the idea is this process continues um, until uh, everybody is uh you know is, is satisfied um or you know if we cannot satisfy everyone then the majority of the agents are satisfied and so satisfaction of the society overall increases does this make sense the rules okay i assume it does so um Oops, and, and uh, I wanted to show a simulation, but I guess when I convert to PDF, uh, GIF is not uh, any more dynamic. All right, so then let's just go into the next slide. Um, yeah, I'll, you, you'll see the simulation, or you can you know Google for Thomas Schilling segregation model, you see how it evolves. So what happens is the following then. Um, we can start with, uh, now we, we looked at, at, at a very small piece, you know, for, we looked at a very small piece, we looked at a three by three um, a unit, right? Now imagine that we have a much larger grid, uh, here it's for the simulation is 50 by 50, and initially all the agents are uh, scattered uh, sort of randomly, um, there are blues and reds, and for this simulation, the tolerance threshold is 50%. So which means um, every uh, blue agent um, will be satisfied if his neighbor's up to 50% red and you know the same true for red. So it is very, it's quite tolerant, right? So it literally half of the neighbors can be of a different um, uh, race and, and, and still you know, the person is satisfied. And then there is a sort of vacancy 5%, um, which means you know, there are 5% of empty spaces, something to log. And then sort of the game proceeds, or the game or the simulation proceeds. Um, and those agents that are not satisfied, they start moving, relocating to new empty spots. And only after 10 iterations, all of a sudden, out of this sort of completely mixed up environment, you start seeing those um, connected clusters, which is amazing that um, it's so quickly, so quickly, um, things kind of from this became that, right? Um, so though each and every agent is tolerant, but still somehow they end up having with completely surrounded by agents of their type. And it's only sort of the boundaries where um, you know, agent of different different types sort of coexist. And then what happens as the simulation proceeds, um, the, the, you know, the ratio of, of the boundaries links to, to overall sort of volume decreases. And so we get less boundaries and we get bigger clusters and sort of li literally after uh, 
in other hundred simulations, um, you literally get sort of two big clusters and complete segregation, um, which is extremely surprising. Uh, why would that happen if uh, you know people are are quite tolerant, or at least you know that sort of the, that the way the model um, is designed? And um, even more striking, again, again, this is a simulation, right? Agent-based modeling, which means you can actually play different scenarios. And what you see here in the matrix, um, this is a sort of final uh, state of the simulation. It's not sort of time evolution anymore. It's the final state of the simulation. Um, when simulation starts with a random initial um, locations for both type of agents, um, different rows corresponds to the different vacancy rate, right? From 2% to white spots uh, to 18%. And uh, horizontally, every column, it actually corresponds to different um, threshold tolerance. And what you can observe easily that, you know, doesn't matter what, um, what um, vacancy is, you eventually, in some middle ranges, you always get a very segregated society. And sometimes it starts with you know, 50%, but sometimes it starts even, even early. And if you have a lot of vacancies, it starts with a little bit more than 30% um, tolerance. So what do you get is that, you know, and, and, and the sort of a Nobel Prize, and this is, this is a big, sort of surprising moment was that though each and every um, each and every agent has a um, quite high, can have a quite high tolerance, um, eventually it's still because of the interaction in between them, it still leads to a segregated society um, with, you know, when we have this level of tolerance. And so we don't want the system itself to lead eventually to segregate society. Well, you know, you need to look at, at you know, the tolerance or somehow help people. And, um, and, and that was sort of this famous paper. And I think there is, it's still the simulation is quite popular. Um, there are very many models that can be casted into this approach. But the point is, it does has all, all it does have all the um, sort of features of uh, agent based model, right? We do have environment, we do have agents, and uh, you know the rules for agents interaction. So that's that. Now, going back to from that sort of you know scientific and uh, you know kind of economic modeling. Um, going back to business type of problems, um, here is um, you know one application. Um, it's a supply chain modeling. Now, um, you know supply chains are actually quite complex, and well, right now we're kind of realizing this. You know, looking outside the window, um, that um, supply chains when they're broken, um, things stop working well. Now, if you think about retail. Um, this is sort of typical supply supply chain for retailers. There are layer, there are, there are customers, there are retailers, and there are wholesalers, and there are distributors, and there are factories who actually produce things. And actually, for the factories, you know, we, we stopped here at the factories, but for the factories, there's also usually um, those who supply either parts of the factories or uh, raw materials, right? Or um, you know, could be if, if it's produce, it can be farmers. So, so those chains can be pretty long and 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 quite complicated. Every factory can deliver to different distributors. Different distributors can go to the same wholesaler or different wholesalers, retailers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the way you know typically it works, customer places an order at the retailer. Um, so, so retailer, you know, if it if if they have um, the required item, they fulfill it. If um, no, then um, request it from wholesalers, or um, if he fulfills, you know, he tries to keep some inventory, um, then request from wholesalers uh, updated his inventory. Now, uh, wholesaler 
tries to you know forecast the demand and and get things from distributors and the factory based on the distributor requests tries to predict and produce based on that demand and so what we can do is in fact in order to understand how those chains operating and in fact you know to design it optimal way right um and to see what happens if for example you know four wholesalers go bankrupt or, or or you know two distributors distributors disappear or if um you know something happens to retailers right in this network that's where simulation can help us and to, to simulate this we can create different type of agents you know factors distributors wholesalers retailers customers and um you know the interaction between them will be putting an order and receiving goods um you know interaction will follow this graph um and there'll be certain rules and uh, you know we'll supply for example you know factory agent you know we'll we'll carry inventory uh, uh we'll have a pipeline of products we'll have shipment receiving orders demands etc cetera, etc cetera, and um can perform certain actions um you know middle agent um and there will be a customer agent customer agent will you know demand um an item and will receive an item and then there is this external clock of course that just sort of runs through this whole simulation and uh by setting up the simulation and setting up those interactions we can actually model this um supply chain and play all kind of what if scenarios uh by reducing you know the, the number of of items in stock um or or you know changing sort of the, the the connectivity pattern uh within the supply chain itself um and uh one more example um is is from a different um industry this is uh more about marketing and uh um, the desire to model consumer behavior um for e-com for b2c e-com think about a website or uh, you know e-commerce where you can sell um some product online and um, again there can be you know consumer agents agent so this is a consumer this is the one that actually um, shops and uh, you know consumer agent might have some social demographic attributes um, but might have might might have uh, you know certain sensitivity to price sensitivity to website ratings and the tendency to follow other agents like consumer agents um, and and so on. Now, um, those properties can be you know you can set them up sort of arbitrarily uh, by a hinge and then see what happens, or you can actually try to mimic what you do see in real life, um, the consumer's behavior on on the site. And then there is a seller agent, so which is uh, you know it can be an internet site and with with technical various technical characteristics and then there is a marketing agent the one that actually um can for some cost um provide certain type of marketing and then there is particular business policies that we can set up in terms of um pricing and finally there is there, there are products right and this can also be um uh, units and agents and then um, there's this whole thing you can actually simulate this interaction and um, the interesting part here would be okay well there are things that a seller agent can change for the product right um, the same product being sold through different strategies you can change price you can put more or less money into advertising um, you can you know charge differently um you can pay different money to be in, in, in a search results um you can make product more or less visible you can provide more or less information about product etc 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 and so you can you can advertise on different sites and so you can actually try to for example you can create agents uh, seller agents um with different strategies um one agent that for example would 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 have higher price but spend less money on advertising the other one will have uh, um, less price uh, but no money on advertising you know higher price more money on advertising etc 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 so then 
let the simulation run and see um, what kind of market share, for example, each agent um, will gain um, with, with the products, right? With a set of products. And then there's a, you know, selecting the agent that is sort of the winning, winning strategy. You can um, then um, use that winning strategy in, in real life, right? Allocating correctly um, um, the budget in between sort of advertising or sponsoring, you know, uh, for the price of the product, et cetera, et cetera. So the same way you can expand this type of modeling by introducing, you know, competitors, um, you can actually um, bring in external information of, uh, from your real site, um, trying to adjust the performance and, and the behavior of every, um, every agent. So in this case, this agent-based modeling um, is used um, as their way to select the optimal um, strategy um, for the seller agent, which is in fact, can be like the entire website. Um, well, um, and there are a lot of books out there as, as always we're like finishing up with a book. Um, um, this is sort of one of the books uh, for this uh, free software. Um, that is, it's called NetLogo that is available um, that allows you to easily build those type of simulations, but you can also actually build those type of simulations in, in, in Python, um, et cetera. It's just sometimes more convenient to use specialized soft. Um, and I think um, you will, you will uh, in, in, in the seminar session, you will try some very simple simulations today. Okay, um, with that, we're done with this topic. Any questions? Yeah, how do we check the validity of these kind of stimulations? Right. So, um, and that's why I, I think I mentioned at the beginning. So there is, um, what you do is you try to um, match it against um, sort of baseline the real life. For example, you know, the, the validity of the simulation, um, you know, if, if we think about um, that original uh, paper by uh, uh, Thomas Schilling, right? He was trying to explain this phenomenon um, of um, of having, you know, of, of observing clusters, right, um, of segregation, and his model does it. Now, when we talk about like very practical models, let's say um, when we talk about uh, supply chain, well, your supply chain is somehow operating right now, right? So there was X number of consumer, uh, there were X number of distributors, factories, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So you do know how many um, items being ordered. Um, you do know, say, you know, the D delay, you do know the pipeline. So you have all that information, right? So you monitor, you have all this historical data. So what you try to do is, first of all, with your agent-based model is to try to reproduce as, as, as good as possible your current situation. So it's usually called baseline, right, scenario. And then after you, you, you succeed, if you succeed, right? If you're not succeeding, then you're probably you're not modeling it correct. Now, but if, if you're succeeding, then you can start asking this what if questions by modifying your models and saying, okay, this is what's gonna happen if we change that or that or that. So um, in, in this sense, yes, it's you're trying to reproduce um, with your simplified model, um, the behavior of your sort of real world system. Thank you, it's quite logical. Any other questions? All right, so again, um, this is a sort of, this is not machine learning, right? Uh, but it is actually a very, very useful tool for data scientists to know. Um, and uh, it is quite practical. And uh, uh, honestly, um, you know, from my experience, when you try to deliver um, to businesses, you know, business usually likes and trusts simulations much more than any other uh, sort of black box machine learning predictive models. All right. Well, with that, we're done today. Thank you, guys.